we have to talk about Nikki Haley, who has made a string of recent faux pas on the subject of racism. I want to roll this first clip where she talks about her own experience as the child of first generation immigrants and an Indian woman growing up in the South. We were the only Indian family in our small southern town. I was teased every day for being brown. So anyone that wants to question it can go back and look at what I've said on how hard it was to grow up in the deep south as a brown girl. Anybody can look at my record and see when Walter Scott was shot down by a dirty cop, how I made sure that the Walter Scott family didn't suffer because we put the first body camera bill in the country in place. Anybody can look at the fact that when we had nine amazing souls die in Mother Emanuel Church, I did something that no Republican or Democrat ever wanted to touch, which was call for the Confederate flag to come down because it would take two thirds of the House and Senate and was an impossible feat. I don't know what you're implying with that, but what I will tell you is, Saying that I had black friends is a source of pride. Saying that I had white friends is a source of pride. If you want to know what it was like growing up, I was disqualified from a beauty pageant because I wasn't white or black, because they didn't know where to put me. So look, I know the hardships, the pain that come with racism. It's the reason that I fight bullies every day when it comes to racism, anti-Semitism, or hate, and I always will. If I didn't mention slavery on that day, it's because that's an automatic. There's always been, the Civil War's always been known about slavery. Yeah, so Nikki Haley, she plays identity politics a lot for my taste. She loves to talk about being a woman in politics and I'm a girl boss this and a girl boss that. But some people were clowning on her over this interview, basically dismissing out of hand the claim that she was teased every day because of her race. Um, and Look, I probably think that it, it it wasn't every day. I doubt that. Uh, that's probably just a figure of speech, how she was speaking casually and not being super precise with her words. But I don't actually find it very hard to believe that she was born in 1972, that a little girl growing up with Indian parents, her dad wore a turban and her mother wore an Indian uh, headscarf would be bullied for that. Like, I actually don't find that hard to believe in the way that a lot of MAGA types seem to be trolling her and being like, LOL, no way. I do find the thing about the beauty pageant a little confusing. And, and I looked into it a little bit and she apparently talked about it in one of her books back in 2012. And her story is that they allowed her to participate in the beauty pageant. But when the time was for everyone to be placed that she and her sister were given like gifts and then taken away and said there wasn't a place for you. And some people think she apparently thinks that's because they weren't white or black. Some people are like, you just didn't place. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, all I'll say is that story sounds a little strange and she hasn't really fleshed it out in coherent detail. But I don't know, like I, people were just dismissing this and I, I don't find it far fetched whatsoever that she would have experienced racism growing up in the South in the 70s. Yeah, I I mean, I grew up in part in South Carolina. I can tell you what the culture was like even in the early to mid 2000s. And it there definitely is still a lot of racism in the state. It was my first time going to public schools when we moved there and I was 16. I went to a school that was probably about 50% white, 50% black, which is the norm for the state. And the way that I saw people interact, the things that I heard said uh, on both sides of the aisle were really quite shocking to me because I did not come from a racist background. I had been pretty insulated from that kind of thing as a homeschooled kid in Kentucky. And I, you know, to this day, really feel like there is a difference in the culture when I go to South Carolina and I visit. And it's, of course, not everybody, but just the norm for things that are said and, and how things are spoken about is quite different than what I experienced living in Atlanta or what I experienced living in Nashville. So I don't find it difficult to believe whatsoever that she faced racism. And I think that it is important to distinguish when we talk about racism that there are different levels of it in my mind, right? Like, do I think there were people burning crosses in her yard? Probably not. Do I think she was being teased and maybe isolated because of her skin color? Most likely. And let's keep in mind that while this woman has absolutely taken advantage of the American dream 
She's risen quite far in politics already. She was governor of the state. She's now running for president. And I think that's a testament to how far this country has come on racial relations. Um, she's also done things like change her name in order to assimilate better, right? Nikki is not her real name, which Trump has pointed out on numerous occasions, often in a derogatory manner, calling well, her She did that as a young child. She did that far, but she, it's like some people have yeah. accused her of doing that for politics. or She did that as a young child. She yeah. changed it. I'm, I'm saying that she probably did it as a young child to fit in better, right? But like in and of itself, the fact that you have to do that or that you feel you have to do that to fit in better. Nikki, so uh, yeah, I totally take in, but Nikki is also a Punjabi nickname. Yeah, and that's fine. But I am saying I think there is evidence that she has encountered racism in her right. life. This is something that she's grappled with. She's written about it in her book. I found um, some excerpts from one of her memoirs where she talked about how her parents couldn't find a landlord to rent them a home. She said they had a babysitter that refused to watch her and that she was teased for being brown. So I, I absolutely do think this is something she's encountered. And if you look at her tenure as governor, what I actually liked about this interview with her is that she raised um, some of the really awful things that occurred during her tenure and how she engaged with them. Walter Scott, I did a video about his case on my show, Copaganda. This was a black man who was absolutely gunned down by police in South Carolina in Charleston in 2015. And then they tried to cover it up. And had it not been for the body camera evidence, they probably would have gotten off with it. And so the fact that she had implemented body cameras, the fact that this was something she was supportive of, that was a really big thing. It was tough to get body cameras on cops back in 2015. I remember working the issue, and especially in red states that tend to be more knee-jerk pro-police, that's a pretty big achievement. Um, taking down the Confederate flag. I know, Brad, this probably sounds crazy to you, but her sticking her neck out to do that in 2015 was a big deal. Um, yeah. Prior to that happening, even Democratic governors had not been able to do that in South Carolina. They actually, I think 15 years before that or so, had put in a compromise deal. Um, yeah, it was in 2000. They put in a compromise deal that, that the Confederate flag would be taken down from the top of the state capitol and moved to like a memorial with Confederate soldiers that was just a few hundred feet away. And that's where it remained until 2015. And after the Emanuel AME shooting with Dylan Roof, where he went and murdered um, numerous black members of a church for overtly racist reasons, she actually stood up and demanded that it come down and really went to bat. And that was um, pretty bold leadership. Like there were not other Republicans in the state or even nationally that were really taking a stand against the Confederate flag. And most of the other people of prominence at the time, it's like, oh, the South Carolina voters need to decide. And she really went to bat against it. And I found this quote from Alex Stroman, who was previously the executive director of the South Carolina GOP. He said, following that tragedy, it was really Nikki Haley's leadership that got it over the line. Other governors had tried and failed. It kind of captures her diplomacy and navigating tough issues and getting things done by having people come on board who were initially completely opposed to bringing the Confederate flag down. So I I think that these are things she should be championing. So while I thought this was a really good interview and she handled the topic exactly as I think somebody should, where she's saying, you know, there has been racism in our past. There's been racism even under my leadership, but here's how I countered it. Here's how I brought people to the table to combat it. And as a whole, we are getting better. We are moving forward and really presenting this like optimistic kind of viewpoint on where the country's going to go on racism. Um, this is not how she's always handled this topic. In fact, she's often really butchered the subject, and many of these clips have been resurfacing in light of this interview. So I want to roll you a series of other clips. Are you a racist party? Are you involved in a racist party? No. We're, we're not a racist country, Brian. We've never been a racist country. Our goal is to make sure that today is better than yesterday. I know I faced racism when I was growing up, but I can tell you today is a lot better than it was then. Our goal is to lift up everybody, not go and divide people on race or gender or party or anything else. We've had enough of that in America. That's why I'm so passionate about doing this. I don't want my kids growing up where they're sitting there thinking that they're disadvantaged because of a color or a gender. I want them to know that if they work hard, yep. they can do and be anything they want to be in America. I in much of the Democratic Party, it's now fashionable to say that America is racist. That is a lie. America is not a racist country. 
So Brad, as you see, on numerous occasions, and these are just two that I pulled out, she denies that America ever had racism, um, says it is not a racist country and really downplays the fact that racism remains anywhere in the country whatsoever, even oftentimes reversing herself within the same interview where she'll then talk about her own experience with racism. And it really is making her look crazy. Yeah, so uh, the part in the first clip where she says America has never been a racist country is is obviously an absurd and untrue statement. <laughs> like, that's just not true. We had Jim Crow. We had slavery. We had all sorts of systemic and individual racism. Uh, I, I Literally, that's just a ridiculous statement. All I can hope is that she was what she was trying to say is America is not a racist country in the present tense. And she just was kind of filibustering and misspoke because she I don't think she actually believes that that's just a ridiculous thing to suggest. Now, for the other sentiment that America is not a racist country, I'm curious. I mean, I agree with with that sentiment. I, I guess it kind of depends what you mean by a racist country, because that to me kind of sounds like if somebody says America is a racist country, I think th it's kind of a black or white. It's like our, America is either they're saying it's deeply corroded by racism at its core, our country versus were a good country that still has some pockets of racism and some problems. It really depends what you mean by that. I don't think anybody can seriously argue that the U.S. is completely devoid of any semblance of racism anywhere in the country. Of course not, right? But at the same time, it would be strange to me to hear anyone argue that America is uniquely racist in, in present day when in fact, we're one of the most diverse melting pots. And it's easy for all these other countries to have no racial issues when they only have people of the same race. Tell me about the diversity in Sweden or Norway. I mean, I actually think for the insane amount of diversity, insane, just in not in a bad way, just in a huge wide array of races and cultures and people that we have all together. Overall, I think the American ethos is very tolerant and is not racist like you might expect with so many groups in close proximity sharing one country, but it's certainly not perfect. So for me, it's all just what does that statement mean exactly? Yeah, I think you make an excellent point in saying that we're not homogenous like many other places are, and we do as a whole get along very, very well with that in mind. But to act like America is also the only country that has issues or pockets of racism is ridiculous. Racism is a human flaw. It exists in all kinds of populations. It's directed at all kinds of demographics, depending on who has the majority, who's in the minority in various locations. So this this question that we get all the time of, is America a racist country? America's not any more of a racist country than any other country is. We have our issues to deal with, as many other people do. But the problem I have with Nikki Haley and her responses on this is that I don't get the sense she's really trying to push back from that standpoint. I get more of the sense that she's talking out of both sides of her mouth, right? She's trying to say America is not a racist country, but she's trying to run so far to the extreme on that and saying that America was never a racist country or there's no current racist problems in America. And I think that's to appease more uh, Republican boomer type people, right, who don't want to confront these issues. And I've seen that myself when I talk about systemic racism, which I absolutely do still think exists in many of our laws. When I talk about racial issues whatsoever, there is a certain subset of the population who wants to shut you down immediately about that. They want to pretend that there's absolutely nothing wrong, that everything's better now. And I don't think that that does anybody any kind of good, right? We need to be able to confront issues and keep progressing on them and keep getting better and better and better. I certainly think in the past couple of years, especially as social media platforms have grown, if anything, we've seen that there's probably more of a racism problem in this country than we initially recognized because some of these people are able to come out of the woodwork and express themselves in ways where they have anonymity still that they would not have been doing in the general public. And so it was less visible. And so and look I think at the wave fine. of anti-Semitism. Yeah, it's fine to grapple with these things, right? I don't think that you as a leader should be running away from that. And if you're doing that to appease a certain demographic that doesn't want to talk about these things, I just think that's seedy and there's a reason they don't want to talk about these factors, right? And you can do it in a way where you are still undercutting what the left is saying, where you're still undercutting this notion that America is especially evil and that all of our institutions need to be overthrown, the constitution, where you're overthrowing this notion that 
all of our institutions need to be overthrown or the constitution needs to be thrown out because we one time had slavery or because we one time did not treat women equally, right? I think that should be pushed back on, but she's not doing that. She's trying to basically say, none of this is real. None of this is happening. I'm with all of you guys that don't think racism is a thing. But then also when it's convenient for her, she wants to use identity politics to talk about her history, to talk about her gender, to talk about her ethnicity. And I just think that that is, it's disrespectful to people. We're not stupid. People see through that. And it's what makes politicians seem so slimy to people because it's so clear that you don't really stand for anything but yourself when you behave in this manner. You don't actually stand up for anything, even for your own experience. If you really were somebody who experienced racism as an immigrant, then I would think that you would feel it within yourself to stand up for other people who might be experiencing those same things. And, and so I just, I really hated this whole thing. I thought it was really gross looking. I mean, I think she handles it in a very ham-handed way, this topic and uh, identity issues in, in general. But I guess I, I have two thoughts. One is there is that portion of America that she may very well be pandering to that simply doesn't want to even acknowledge America's history of racism. You know, it, it brings to mind a really interesting thing that happened when I visited Charleston, South Carolina, and did a tour. And they, the amazing tour guide, super knowledgeable, was telling us all about the slave market and how the ships would come in with the slaves. And this is where, you know, like 40% of all slaves that came to America passed through this port, all blah, blah, blah. And he was telling us that he gets reviews from angry people who come on the tour and call him woke because he talks about slavery a, a fair bit when he talks about the history of the city. And he didn't say anything woke. Like, I am not woke. And I can tell you, he just was talking about the history of slavery, which is a very important part of the history of Charleston and of the American South. And uh, so I totally get what you're saying there in terms of there is always going to be that little bit of or, or that portion of society that wants to be told everything's rosy and to not even acknowledge the wrongs of the past. The other thing, though, I guess to give her the, the benefit of the doubt, she could be saying, yeah, I experienced all this racism in the 70s and 80s. And today, America is not a racist country. She's also talked about the progress she's witnessed. Um, and I think those two things can be true at the same time. But she definitely wants to play both sides of this game. She definitely wants to whip out the, you know, the left is wrong. America is, is not racist at all. Uh, but then also look how amazing it is that I'm a woman of color rising to the top of politics. You know, she did this one thing that really pissed me off, Hannah. I, and I am not somebody, I'm not a hater. I'm just, this thing really made me mad. She keeps saying that she never said Hillary Clinton inspired her to become a woman in politics. Babe, you're on camera. We've all seen the clip. You literally said Hillary Clinton inspired you to become a woman in politics. And I actually look... I don't even that statement doesn't bother me. I understand like with Republicans, they might be like, I can't believe she was inspired by Hillary Clinton. I get it, though, to see a woman in politics, even if it's somebody you don't like and don't agree with, could be inspiring. Like that to me is uncontroversial. It doesn't bother me in the slightest to see her gaslight and openly deny making a statement that she's on tape making pisses me off. But of course, she's hardly the only politician to do that. <laughs> We can actually talk about all kinds of equal offenders on that front. But yeah, I've, I've not seen that clip. But to be honest, if you think about being a little girl in the 70s, how many women in politics did you have to look up to in the United States? There still aren't that many people, uh, women in positions of power. So it's not saying that you agree with somebody's ideology to say that you were inspired by them or you yeah. you know, wanted to be in similar rooms as they were in. So I don't I think honestly, for me, what I am so hungry for and what I think most people are hungry for is just people who tell the truth, who are honest up front. And again, you know, I, I get what you're saying that she could say I experienced this in the 70s and 80s, but her own tenure as governor had two of the worst racism murders that we've seen in the past, you know, 20 years. So you can't really sidestep it and just say this only happened in the 70s, 80s. I think what you have to say is I faced this in the 70s and 80s. It's gotten better. But even under my tenure as governor, these things happened. They were awful. Here's how I confronted them. Here's how we could do that at a national level to try to come together and actually ensure that we don't have black men being killed at higher rates than white men by police, that we don't have these these um, horrible attacks like we saw at this church in Charleston, right? Like, I don't I don't see the point in running from these things except to appease that certain subset of voters. And I don't respect that because I just think 
those people, if you really have, if you're triggered by somebody talking about slavery and telling you the basic history of what happened in Charleston, if you cannot admit that there is still racism around you, to me, it's kind of a red flag. Like, why can you not confront those things? Why are you so desperate to pretend that they're not real, that they aren't happening? I, I really don't like it. And I don't think it does the right any any favors because the perception on the left is and has been that many people on the right are racist. And I don't think that's largely accurate. I really don't. I will say the Trump movement kind of made me eat crow on that to some degree because I didn't think it was true at all until the Trump movement. And that certainly has brought some real racism out of the woodwork, like I said. But as a whole, I really have not found that to be true, right? Like I saw a picture circulated on Twitter this week from a Democrat. It was a big uh, family of black people and they were all holding guns. And he was like, this is when the right would turn against guns. Just show them this picture. And I'm like, Oh, I think you're projecting. Most people on the right would love this picture, would love to see more black families get into gun ownership and self-defense. And so there's this perception that I don't think is accurate for the majority of people on the right. But when you conduct yourself in this way, when you refuse to just call a spade a spade and discuss racial issues like a normal person, to me, it, it really is something that looks like, ooh, that maybe there is something there beneath the surface, right? That's how it looks to people on the left, for sure. Whereas if you could say what my tone would be, which is that, yeah, there's still issues we need to confront, and mostly they are stemming from the government, and that's why I want to limit the government and get it out of your way and make sure it can't harm you in this way, and maybe you should work with me to that end because we both have the same end goal there. That's how you actually can reach new people and kind of fight back against those really terrible stereotypes. But I think until people start doing that, it's it's not going to happen. I hear people on the right complain all the time about how they can't, you know, reach people in the black community. They can't reach the immigrants who are coming into this country. And there's this real fear that, like these numbers are going to dwindle and we'll never you know, be able to get power again. But I know on just my personal level, like when I was working for a black gospel company back in the 2010, 2011 era, and I was first starting to like talk about politics more openly, I had several black colleagues come to me and say, you know, I've never known a real like person on the right before. I always thought you guys were racist, but I really agree with a lot of what you're saying. I started looking into it more and now I'm curious and like, there's really nothing racist about your beliefs, but I was just told that. And it's like meeting one person that actually speaks about issues in a way that pertains to what they're facing, that is sympathetic and that shows like, no, I actually meaningfully care about you and what you're up against that can do tremendous good that can really affect change quite quickly and so i don't blame anybody but people on the right for that not happening it's terrible outreach it's terrible messaging and i just think this whole slew of interviews is a major facepalm